Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Felix, and today we're speaking with Dev Burrell, who is working on developer relations at Jump Crypto, a core contributor to Wormhole. Wormhole is a cross-chain messaging protocol that allows users to access applications across networks. Before we talk with Dev about Wormhole, we'd like to talk, uh, tell you about our sponsors this week. Omni. Omni is your favorite new multi-chain mobile wallet that puts the power of Web3 at your fingertips. In just three taps, you can stake and manage your assets on over 22 built-in protocols, including all major EVMs, Layer 2s, and non-EVMs like Cosmos, Solana, and Year and more. Omni extracts away all complexity while being fully self-custodial, meaning getting yield on your crypto has never been this easy and secure. Omni also has multi-chain NFT support, so you can view all of your NFTs in one place. And you can flex your cleanest NFT by studying it as your app background. Don't forget to check the Explore section in the app for your daily fix of the hottest dApps, yields, and news across chains. On September 7th, Omni upgraded its app to provide you with more functionality than tens of different DeFi dApps and wallets combined. To highlight their transformation, they renamed from Stake Wallet to Omni the Next Generation Super Wallet. Join thousands of users on this Next Generation Wallet by downloading it today on iOS or Android at omni.app. Another news, we're hiring. Epicenter is hiring. We're looking for a community manager to help grow our audience and take Epicenter to the next level. If you're passionate about crypto and creating great content, we want to hear from you. Full details can be found at the careers page that we're going to link in the show notes. Uh, please share with anyone who you think might be a good fit for this role. So today I'm really excited to jo be joined by Dev, uh, who's working with, uh, as a core contributor with Wormhole. Wormhole is an exciting network uh, and uh, cross-chain protocol. Um, generally, we start these episodes uh, by introducing our guests. So hi, Dev. Hi, happy to be here. Hey, Dev, you're a core contributor to Wormhole with Jump. Uh, usually at the start of the episode, we often try to find out how did our guests get into crypto? And in this case, also specifically, how did you get into working with Jump on Wormhole? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm one of the very old people in crypto. Um, I got into crypto in like 2013 uh, in, in high school. Uh, this was before we even called crypto um, you know, blockchain. This was in the Bitcoin days. And I got involved with an organization called the Blockchain Education Network. Uh, back back then, it was like the Bitcoin Education Network um, called Ben, um, and I used to uh, organize events with like all the disparate college students all around the universities uh, in the United States, uh, so we could do meetups and hackathons and so on. Uh, and I got really into decentralized identity, zero knowledge proofs, all that kind of stuff. Uh, fast forward, uh, I've built a couple companies, um, and then eventually uh, I ended up joining Jump. Um, as a developer relations. But one of the most interesting facts is that while I was doing, um, I've been doing developer advocacy for a long time. While I was working in decentralized identity uh, and building my startups, uh, I was also uh, going around to over 200, 300 hackathon events, um, sponsoring, mentoring, or participating at dressed up in a full spacesuit, teaching students how to write like Solidity code uh, as if it was the word of God, you know, like the, this is the coolest thing. So one of my greatest achievements, one of the things that I'm really proud of is that there are hundreds, if not thousands of engineers whose first ever taste of blockchain uh, the technology was through one of my workshops. Uh, so taking all of that, all of that experience and all of that um, history with crypto and all of that, uh, you know, context around um, how crypto uh, was formed, um, I eventually applied for a job at Jump uh, through my friend Anthony Ramirez, um, who mentioned that uh, they were looking for uh, core contributors for one, uh, you know, one of the projects that they feel really passionate about, which is Wormhole. Um, and Wormhole again is a cross messaging platform. Now, I got really excited about Wormhole because um, I'm an engineer and I love um, I love uh, tackling a lot of different problems. So uh, I was coming from the Solidity world. But I wanted to have a lot of different, like I wanted to go into different ecosystems. And so Wormhole is an interesting challenge where um, as an engineer, I don't just have to, I, I don't just do, uh, I don't have to learn just one ecosystem. I have to like really be on my feet dancing uh, and learning a lot of different challenging ecosystems. And, uh, uh, you know, whether that's Rust for Solana, Move for Aptos and Sui, Cosmosm for Injective or what, you know, any of these uh, ecosystems. 
um, and picking that knowledge up and picking those architectures up. So uh, ended up at uh, Jump. We're doing core contribution for Wormhole back in February of this year. Yeah, that's a amazing history. I I didn't know that you have been around for so long. That's that's super cool to have guests there that are like dating way back and have seen a lot. I'm, I'm sure you took a lot of lessons away from that. And uh, as our guests can see today, you don't wear a, a spacesuit anymore. But uh, maybe maybe you can make a return. <laughs> I still got the I still got my space painting. I don't know up there if you can see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> nice space paint. Um, Cool. All right. Yeah, definitely. I think yeah, one of the super interesting things I think about wormhole or generally about the space you're you're in is, is like you said, you're touching upon so many different network ecosystems. That's actually quite similar to what, what we're working on. And I think that's one of the nice spots in the space. But I guess before we dive into that even more, uh, maybe you can like explain to us, you know, what what specifically what is wormhole in your words? And then we can take it from there. Yeah, so Wormhole is a cross-chain messaging layer. And a lot of people confuse this, um, or confuse two things. They confuse Wormhole and Portal. And I'll talk about what those things are separately in just a second. But Wormhole basically um, is a way for us, uh, in, in layman's terms, it's a way for users to not care about developer choices. And what I mean by that is, um, when we look at blockchains, we look at uh, blockchains as different infrastructure providers. Just like in Web2, we have Microsoft Azure, um, we have AWS, we have Google Cloud Engine, um, we have our Google Cloud Platform. Um, in, in Web3, we have Solana, Ethereum, Polygon, uh, Injective, you know, all of these different chains. These are all infrastructure. A user should not care about what infrastructure um, the developer chooses to deploy their application. When I go to my bank's website, I don't care that my bank is on Google Cloud Platform, right? I just care that it's a good application that I get to use, um, and that's it. And so Wormhole is that missing piece of technology that allows um, different infrastructure providers to connect to each other so the end user can get an application rather than uh, an infrastructure to interact with. Um, so it's this layer on top of um, blockchains that really for the end user makes it so they can interact with just clear applications. Now on top of that, an application was built called Portal. The Portal Asset Bridge is what most people, uh, you know, and, and consumers uh, actually end up using. And it's a simple way to just move, uh, you know, tokens from one chain to another. Now, while it's super useful right now, because one of the biggest use cases for blockchain technology is tokens, um, we have seen we're seeing some interesting use cases pop up that are non-token based uh, use cases. For example, like cross-chain governance um, or NFT support or like uh, you know gaming or uh, other things that are not just tokens. And those are going to use that generic message passing layer that Wormhole has without necessarily using token passing as we see it in Portal. All right, thanks. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. I think there's really there's a lot of applications that can still be unlocked. And uh, before you even had something like Wormhole, right? Like the general way of bridging to other networks is either impossible or through some centralized party. So I think this is a very important like kind of step towards really interconnecting this, this, this these ecosystems. Um, now, you mentioned already like a bunch of the chains that um, Wormhole today supports. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how how do you add support uh, for for a network in Wormhole? Um, what are the challenges with, with adding a new network uh, to this um, kind of uh, layer, uh, to this protocol? Yeah, so first and foremost, Wormhole is a decentralized protocol. What that means is the core contributors can't just add a network. This is one of the biggest misconceptions that people usually run into. The core contributors might uh, write some code uh, that says, hey, we, we can add in, uh, here's sample code, here's a, here's a working uh, connection to this new network. But at the end of the day, it gets proposed uh, to our guardians. Our guardians are uh, the wormhole validators. So every wormhole validator, um, would, uh, which observes messages on all of the chains that we connect to, um, has to basically uh, run a node for every chain that wormhole wants to connect to. And so if a, if a new network wants, uh, wants to be added to the wormhole uh, ecosystem, 
they have to propose to the guardians, hey, please run a node um, for our, uh, you know, our chain, our network, our uh, you know, protocol. And the wormhole guardians have to do a governance vote. The 19 guardians have to decide, yes, we want to run this network. No, we don't want to run this network. And after that um, uh, uh, vote passes, um, is that network live? Yeah, that makes sense. That's, I guess, um, so can you talk a little bit about how does this, I guess this guardian said today who they are and I guess how the governance works now and maybe also a little bit how do you plan to expand it? You mentioned there's 19. Obviously, it's a very high burden, I guess, on these guardians to support so many networks. How do you maybe imagine or how does Wormhole imagine to to grow that? And, and um, um, yeah, what, what do you see as the steps for that? Yeah, so the Guardian Network was chosen as the top 19 validators in the space. Um, so uh, it's not that, um, you know, these are 19 random validators. These are validators that are uh, in the blockchain space, um, unique and uh, separate. Um, so there's a very high anti-collusion probability. What that means is like they, there's very, it's very unlikely that these 19 unique companies would collude with each other. Uh, because they are, uh, they have a reputation at stake. So beyond uh, beyond just um, you know value of like other, uh, for example, our competitors might say uh, use a proof of stake system, which allows you to become a guard or become a validator on their network. Um, on on the wormhole uh, guardian network, um, you have your reputation at stake as well, uh, because um, there's there's that bigger. Uh, context of this, these guardians being the bigger uh, validators in the space. Um, and again, as we mentioned, there's a big burden there. Now, there, we are thinking about um, ways to propose to guardians to expand the uh, guardian set. Uh, the wormhole contributors are working on improvements such as worm chain um, and a, a variety of other improvements um, that we can't just talk. Uh, we can't talk about just yet, just because the designs aren't finalized. Um, but uh, the idea is uh, if the Guardians uh, want to expand and want to grow, um, there are potential ways that uh, we're currently uh, discussing with them uh, to grow that, uh, grow that pie. That being said, again, like you said, it's a huge burden to be a Guardian on a wormhole network. So one of the scaling solutions that we're looking into right now is instead of having Guardians run full nodes, um, use something like uh, zero-knowledge proofs. Um, uh, for validation, and we're trying that out, um, you know, in uh, in testing and design phasing right now. So we don't have to worry about um, guardians running full nodes, but they can actually run zero knowledge proof systems uh, to test state from different chains um, and grow that uh, grow that validator set. Um, awesome! Yeah, that is definitely something we should get into a little bit later again, because that seems quite interesting. Uh, how how you might use zero knowledge proofs to do that. But I guess before we get there, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about just kind of the bridging experience. Now talking about portal, if you have a new network, can you walk us a little bit through how would I as a user interact uh, with portal? And um, yeah, can you just like walk us through this flow maybe? Yeah, so to interact with Portal, uh, first of all, you can just go to portalbridge.com. I believe that's the website. Let me double check. Yeah, portalbridge.com. Um, but uh, really, so the way Wormhole works is um, you start on a source chain, you emit a message, that, emis that message gets observed by the guardians to make sure that it's valid, and then a relayer comes along, picks it up, and then submits it onto the target chain. The most confusing um, and uh, you know non-intuitive part about this is the relayer, and the re and we'll talk about why in just a second. But everything else uh, is fairly simple. You go to portalbridge.com, you start your transfer. You say, "I want to bridge, you know, five whatever tokens over to um, a different network." Now, it's really important to note uh, the difference between bridging a token and swapping a token. A lot of people come to Portal and they are like, uh, why can't I swap a token? Why is it only letting me bridge a token? And the reason for that is um, when you bridge a token, you're sending the same token from point A to point B. When you swap a token, you are exchanging one token for uh, from one token to another token on another chain. 
And swapping a token requires things like price oracles, requires things like exchange rates, requires someone to take on counterparty risk. There are other applications that have been built on top of Portal that uh, allow you to swap uh, tokens. For example, Swim is a great example where you can do stable swaps. Uh, and uh, you know we have a couple of other um, partners that are building uh, some swaps uh, that you can interact with. But Portal basically is a very basic primitive that lets you just bridge the same token from point A to point B. The second thing to note about Portal bridging, just like any kind of bridging, um, is that uh, the way bridges generally work is that they lock up your token on one side and they mint an IOU on the second on the other side. So they uh, mint a wrapped version of the token on the foreign chain. The wrapped version can always be redeemed one for one for the locked up version on the source chain. So it can be treated uh, basically the same as if it was this, you know, um, the source chain token. Um, but that means that if you want to use it um, on the foreign chain, sometimes you might run into problems because you have to swap it for the native version. An example is USDC. So for example, if I want to bridge USDC from say Ethereum to Solana, um, USDC has its own mints on Ethereum and Solana. And so if you're using Portal, you might have to, after you bridge your USDC over to Solana, swap the Portal USDC um, into the native mint uh, for USDC on Solana. So those are two kind of caveats, the gotchas that people often run into with Portal. Now let's talk about the relayer bit that I just discussed um, a little while ago. The relayer um, is a kind of dumb piece of software. Uh, it's a web service that listens for messages that guardians have signed and submits them onto target chains. It's necessary because someone has to pay the gas uh, for transactions on the target chain. Right? There's no such thing as a free lunch. Just because you create a transaction on a source chain doesn't mean that you have paid the gas on the foreign chain. So the relayer is in charge of paying the gas on the foreign chain. Now you might be asking, why would a relayer do this? The reason relayers do this is when you're creating a transaction on the uh, a source chain, one of the things that you're doing is that you can often attach a fee for a relayer. You can say, here's 50 cents, please relay my transaction to Solana. And a relayer might say, okay, cool. The transaction fee is only 25 cents. So I'll pay, I'll pay the transaction fee. I'll pay the gas fee on Solana and pocket the difference between the relayer fee and the gas fee. And in this way, if they do enough transactions, they can actually earn money. Um, and so, uh, but they can't modify the message in any way. The wormhole architecture is such that it's just a dumb message. Uh, but basically relayers can just submit messages to target chains. Hopefully that covers uh, the portal flow. Yeah, that that's that's super interesting. And so the the benefit for the user, I guess, is also that this tip that you give the relayer, you're paying that in the native currency on the source chain, or can you also like attach tips in different ways, or how does it currently work? Yeah. So right now, um, it, it, you can pay in uh, I think stable coins and native currencies. Um, but um, there's nothing stopping you from attaching a fee in whatever token you choose. The relayer just has to accept it. And relayers um, are selective about accepting different tokens because they want to make sure that the tokens they're accepting actually have liquid markets, um, right? If you attach, for example, you know, your Shiba Inu derivative time, you know, 12, uh, and that doesn't have a, a liquid market anywhere, uh, the relayer might not be willing to accept that as a fee because they can't exchange it for something that they can use to pay gas. Makes sense. And maybe like in practice, do you have insights into like how many of these relayers are running or is this like something that, you know, is dominated by certain people that are like lo that run this and or... Is it like more distributed? Would you like to see more people running relayers? Yeah, we definitely want to see more people running relayers. Um, I think right now we have something like 10 relayers running. Um, but uh, basically, uh, one of the things that we often see is that uh, there aren't uh, relayers. So uh, relayers are a huge topic of conversation. Like we could spend hours talking about just relayers because we have new things rolling out called generic relayers, plug-in relayers. There's relayers are a huge amount of um, optimization that's being done in the wormhole network. Uh, but as they stand right now, um, one of the things is that um, 
we generally see application specific relayers. And what that means is just like portal is an application, if you have an application using wormhole, um, you might actually um, run your own relayer um, just for the messages for your application. And so generally we see a variety of different app of relayers where you have, you might have 10 portal relayers running on various different chains. Uh, so for every chain that Wormhole connects to, there might be a different relayer that's submitting messages for each chain. That way they only have to worry about the gas for the specific chain that they're submitting transactions on. Uh, but then you also see application specific relayers. And so in that case, you might have, you might have as many relayers as there are, um, you know, applications. So the answer is it, it is distributed. It is kind of a scatter uh, plot of different uh, modules. And we're trying to make that mu uh, you know, much easier uh, by writing uh, some sample code uh, and writing some architecture that makes plugin relayers really, really easy and uh, easy to deploy. All right, awesome. Yeah, that's that's very cool. I think, um, I guess, you know, the we talked a little bit about this bridging and then the assets that are created essentially when you move through the chain. As, and as far as I understand, like basically what you're saying is also that wormhole basically won't cover this use case of like switching then to the native token, whatever that might mean. But that is something that should be built on top and is being built on top, uh, potentially even by the application that is is using wormhole as like kind of a infrastructure. Now, um, I guess maybe the question is, is there also like, are some of these wormhole bridged assets being used directly uh, when there is maybe no native token on that chain? Uh, and... Um, how does liquidity work in that case? Uh, how, how do you guarantee that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the word we use for it, so uh, in the USDC example, USDC has a, has a mint on both chains. But if you don't have a mint on any chains, for example, you create your token, we call these uh, cross-chain tokens or cross-chain assets, X assets. If you want your token to be an X asset, all you have to do is uh, create it on one chain and then use a bridge to have a canonical representation of it on all other chains. So for example, if tomorrow I were to launch DevCoin um, uh, and then just bridge it over using Portal onto Clayton and uh, you know uh, Ethereum and all these other different chains, um, I would just have the Portal wrapped version, but because I would claim it as the canonical version of that token, um, uh, I would let developers know that, hey, um, please use the token here as the official token. And so that way you help consolidate liquidity pools. Now there's nothing stopping someone from using a different bridge to bridge that token over, but because I've taken the proactive step as a developer to say that the canonical version of my token is the portal wrapped version of my token, generally developers will consolidate around that token rather than um, they're using different bridges. So a lot of this has to do with just you know user awareness um, and user experience and letting p developers and, and users know that, hey, um, you can use my token on other chains. You can use this token on other, other chains, but please use the canonical mint rather than uh, a non-canonical mint as otherwise you would need a liquidity pool. I see. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I've, I think a lot of the issues of the user experience actually that are supposed to be solved somewhat by the bridges kind of reappear in this, like now we have these different uh, representations. It obviously also creates like a little bit opportunity maybe for like these swap protocols. I know like, for example, Saber on Solana had like a big kind of market just to like exchange between these different representations in, in a stable swap manner. Uh, but obviously, I don't know if that's the ideal path. So would you generally say that you would like, is the goal for Bromhole to like get these X assets to be the canonical representation? Um, I assume basically the answer is yes, but maybe maybe on top of that, yeah, is that kind of also part of, let's say, the business model for Wormhole to have that? Or I guess we kind of talked so, a little bit about. Or yeah, maybe let me let me, let me yeah let me maybe um, introduce a concept here that it will help uh, guide this conversation. One of the things that a Wormhole Core contributors just uh, launched and was approved to mainnet is uh, contract control transfers. You might hear this uh, called payload three. Um, it's a portal specific payload. And 
I'll talk about why I'm talking about this technical, it's a technical thing, but it allows for, it's a primitive that allows for building some really, really cool swap infrastructure. And so contract control transfers allow you to send tokens alongside a payload from one chain to another. And this is really, really cool because in one atomic transaction, you can say, I want to say, send Ethereum um, along with the payload, the payload says, please swap this Ethereum for Solana. Um, and then um, I send the Solana to this address. And so what this will do is I can pay an Ethereum on one side, have that atomic transaction, that transaction goes to Solana, swaps it for a uh, soul and deposits the soul into the account that I want. Um, and then pays the relay or whatever the fee is. And what that allows me to do is, again, do that swap, build that swap on top of Portal without needing to do multiple transactions. And in one atomic transaction, you can bridge and swap. So that's something that we're really excited about. And we think that like major swaps and not just major swaps, a major use cases. For example, say I have a game on Solana and to play the game, you have to pay uh, the gas fee in Seoul. Well, one of the things that I, you can enable is actually I want to, uh, you know, spend my ETH. I can create a wrapper contract around the game or, you know, however I want to implement it. But I pay an ETH. The ETH gets transferred, converted to Seoul, and then pays for the gas cost uh, for the play button on the, on the game. And so this way I can pay for the gas cost for the application on Solana, even though I'm sending money from a uh, foreign chain like Ethereum. I see, yeah, that, that sounds super promising and kind of brings back that composability that is probably needed to really create a user experience that is like mass adoption ready. So that, that's really cool. I think, you know, we mentioned a bit that how relayers basically earn money in terms of like just the, um, yeah, the, the fees that are attached to these payloads, is there what if there is there something like how it works for guardians or how why do guardians do it or if you can talk about it like are the plans for this and uh, how might it work or even if there's nothing clear yet could you talk about what some of the options maybe are that that could exist in such a in this network. Yeah, so like the business model for Wormhole is really not really a business model. Wormhole is um, a, a, a public infrastructure. So the way Jump looks at Wormhole is that it's public infrastructure. The reason Jump has core contributors that work on Wormhole is that um, there's a belief that um, there, uh, there needs to exist applications on top of Wormhole that are super useful, that are investable, that are businesses. Uh, but to build those businesses, requires this public infrastructure. So one of the reasons the Guardians and Trump and other uh, interested stakeholders are building on top of Wormhole or contributing to Wormhole is that if this public infrastructure exists, then uh, there's a pathway to building businesses that can, that can have bigger business models on top of Wormhole. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks, that, that, that's, that's super helpful. Just like you need like an electric grid to exist before you can build like computers and you know all of these other things. So th there's a belief that uh, the the future uh, applications that are monetizable, um, that are going to be super interesting to use and so on, uh, require this kind of public infrastructure to exist. Okay. So, but then they would still at some point have to pay for this infrastructure potentially these applications once it's more let's say ingrained in the the system or is that something that could happen or how how yeah. do you see that play out yeah so there's definitely talks about you know um how can wormhole be self-sustainable um and and so on um the again all of this is in the design phase so i don't want to mention any specific thing because in case uh, the guardians reject it like Wormhole, wormhole core contributors might say, hey, this is like a thing you could do. And the Guardians might say, no, that's not actually what we want to do. Or the Guardians might say, um, hey, we want to actually implement this. 
Um, and, you know, I, and I just don't know about it or things like that. So there are a lot of plans that are being shaped about how to build wormholes uh, self-sustainability, uh, but that's currently a lower priority uh, than making sure that that infrastructure exists in the first place. All right. Makes sense. Thanks for expanding on that. I think that that surely is interesting for a lot of users and the guardians and everyone, including uh, me even. Uh, so uh, that's that's cool. And I guess maybe to get back a little bit to kind of the security assumptions or like just in general bridges. So I think, you know, maybe for context or also for our listeners, there's definitely, you know, a lot of concerns around these bridges since it's like very complex technology. A lot of the hacks that actually have happened in the past year have been kind of related to bridges. I think if you looked at the React leaderboard, there is uh, a lot of like bridges, a lot of value that has been kind of um, lost in, in the bridges. Of course, uh, unfortunately, Wormhole was also um, part of this. Now, maybe um, you can talk a little bit about, you know, why, I guess, first of all, why is, is it that bridges seem to have like more of the these kind of issues if if that's true and then i guess also like what wormhole learned from this specific incident and kind of like what specifically changed in the approach to to building wormhole or actually like really in the code that that maybe kind of makes these kind of incidents less likely yeah, so let's first of all um, just talk about the wormhole hack and specifically what happened just so everyone has the same context and that way everyone's on the same page. So uh, the wormhole hack happened actually the third day um, when I was a uh, core contributor for wormhole. Um, so I just joined on and the you know third day this hack happened. Um, but what, one of the, the things that happened was um, a bug in our Solana code. Um, and so... Um, uh, you, you can read the whole write-up on our medium. It goes into detail about exactly how it happened. Uh, but basically, one of the uh, signature verification programs that uh, the wormhole core code uh, called in was spoofed. And instead of um, actually checking signatures, it just returned valid for whatever signatures. Um, so how that happened and all of the other readmes, you can go and read that. Now, one of the reasons that bridges specifically are such a big honeypot for hackers is this concept of their, their large vaults of um, locked up cryptocurrency. They uh, take in uh, large amounts of um, currency on uh, the cryptocurrencies on uh, any given chain and they lock it up. And so they have this massive reserve. And on the other side, uh, they, uh, they create IOUs um, that can be used and redeemed wherever, wherever possible. So one of the reasons uh, that uh, people, hackers specifically like this is if they break a bridge, they get everything that's in the large vault of the locked up currencies. Uh, this is kind of, you know, this is ex as, as, a, as a hacker, it's a pretty low bear, like a, a low attack vector for a large you know, reward. Now, what's being done to kind of mitigate this risk is uh, after the hack happened, a um, couple of things that the wormhole core contributors started looking into was how can we uh, mitigate attacks such that if something happens on one chain, so there, there's always going to be smart contract risk. If you're going to create open source co uh, so software, there's always going to be smart contract risk because that uh, all of the contracts are open source. Anyone can look at them and they can you know uh, run attacks on them all day long until they find a zero day and then use it. So how can we actually mitigate these this risk? One of the things is uh, something that we call accounting, and that's a, a basically um, to deploy um, a middle layer uh, between all the chains that actually keeps track of how much is money is moving in and out of any given chain. And what that allows us to do, uh, or allows a wormhole to do, is um, actually limit attacks when uh, an attack happens on one chain, when uh, portal gets, uh, if, if portal gets attacked on one chain, that attack uh, limit is the size of the chain itself. So if, if like Ethereum goes down, then we have a bigger problem because Ethereum has a large number of locked assets. But if one of the smaller chains goes down, it's less of a, you know, it, it doesn't affect the entire locked worth, uh, locked net worth. Um, secondly, a huge, huge, huge help that's, uh, you know, we've really uh, been proud of is uh, the wormhole bug bounty program. 
Uh, we launched with, I think, one of the largest bug bounties in the space, $10 million. Uh, we've had uh, a couple of really good submissions that have helped us find bugs right before they happen. Um, uh, so that's been really, really, really exciting that uh, people have responded to that um, and we've been able to secure and you know help build uh, security in the bridge. Um, and then a couple of other things that we're working on um, are things like uh, worm chain. So worm chain you might have heard of um, mentioned a couple of times. Uh, you can go read about it in our design docs on the GitHub. Uh, but basically, worm chain is this uh, as is this middle layer between all the chains uh, that we can kind of use to do accounting and other things. Another thing that we're working on is uh, limits. We call it governor. So, for example, um, this actually went live, I think, two weeks ago, um, which uh, if, you're, uh, if you're transacting large amounts between portal from one chain to another, all the guardians actually have to approve uh, I, uh, uh, certain limits on each chain. So, for example, you might not be able to, and this is just a random number, I don't know the exact governor limits, you can look them up on the GitHub uh, but like if you're moving from Ethereum to Solana, you might not be able to move more than like $100 million in a, in a day and you might have to wait until the next day. Um, so th these kinds of governor limits um, also help mitigate, mitigate risk. And we're working on a number of other features. Um, uh, there's a research team that's dedicated to coming up with um, kind of uh, uh, security tools um, and uh, security best practices. Um, and we're not doing this alone. Uh, bridge, just as you mentioned, bridges are one of the most vulnerable pieces of technology in the ecosystem because they're honeypots and these, you know, they're large vaults that lock up uh, large amounts of cryptocurrencies. And so um, we're actually uh, working with, uh, you know, other bridges and trying to work with, uh, trying to understand, um, are, there, are, are there ways that we can uh, do better in, in terms of security across the board? Yeah. Thanks. That's that's super insightful. I think also we'll link to all these, or like try to link to most of these documents or things that we mentioned, especially, I guess, uh, the bug bounty program, the write up, and uh, maybe things about worm chain in, in the show notes. So if you're listening to this, uh, hopefully the links will be there. Uh, if not, uh, hit us up and we'll, we'll send them to you, hopefully, or Google it. Um, so, right, I think the security question obviously is is like a pretty big one you we mentioned already earlier a little bit around zero knowledge proofs i guess is this another kind of venue that might make it more secure or is it more just like around scalability or what are the benefits of of using that again maybe uh uh for for wormhole um and then maybe you can also talk a little bit about how exactly or like not exactly but how do you plan to incorporate uh, this technology into wormhole and, and what might it bring in terms of benefits? Yeah, at a high level, the way we um, the Bridges um, plan on using zero knowledge proofs is basically to attest the state of an entire chain um, on just as a rollup does. Um, basically, attest the state of an entire chain using block headers um, onto um, uh, another chain. So basically you say, Oh, Solana has the past 100 blocks. We're going to roll them up uh, with all the block headers. Um, we're going to uh, uh, submit a zero knowledge proof. And then anytime a change is made to the, you know, uh, made to this uh, next block, uh, the new zero knowledge proof must be computed such that um, it, it still uh, listens to the old zero knowledge or it still complies with the old zero knowledge proof. And then you can, you can validate that. And you can keep submitting those proofs and then uh, you can run a set of, um, you know, the guardians basically just uh, go around validating the zero knowledge proofs and making sure that, you know, the, the, that no invalid proofs are submitted. But um, again, a lot of this is still in the design phase because there's a certain number of requirements to this. Uh, depending on different chains or different ecosystems, this gets really complex. Um, people are used to zero knowledge proofs in the EVM ecosystem. Uh, but validating proofs on, for example, Solana is a lot harder than EVM because of like compute limits and so on, um, and uh, no uh, native support for uh, like uh, you know a Grot sixteen verifier or any of these things. So um, when we talk about zero knowledge proofs, one of the challenges is that uh, we don't have uniformity across different ecosystems, 
And so, uh, you know, one of Jump's research teams, uh, what they're working on is really just finding that uniform uh, validation ground between different ecosystems um, that we can we can use this across uh, all the chains that Wormhole connects to. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've, I think also even Ethereum, right, a lot of these, because that's a very fast moving like space where a lot of the new cryptographic curves and stuff has been co coming out only like recently. And I guess many of the chains didn't have in mind that they might want to use this and it might have to be added in hindsight or later or even can't maybe be added. So I have, I know I've seen like a bunch of, you know, even like in Ethereum, right? I think adding BLS signatures was, was like a whole process that, that took forever. So definitely a very exciting space. And I think, yeah, I should, should be able to, to add a lot to the, to the user experience and the security of, um, of using, uh, bridges. So thanks for expanding and cool to hear that, um, jump, I guess is also contributing a bunch in this space. Um, so maybe like switching again, a bit to a different topic, like more application level stuff. I think, you know, one of the very interesting things, I mean, wormhole has been super successful, I think for a while, maybe the biggest bridge or, or, or at least in the very top, it's still in the top three probably. And, um, but if I look at the TVL, right, it was like, I think almost 5 billion for, for a moment. And then obviously the market crashed, but there was also another event that, uh, that like brought this down a lot, which is, is the Terra collapse. So obviously Terra was a big kind of driver of the usage of wormhole because people wanted to, uh, bring assets to anchor or, um, kind of integrate that. So like one of the things that anchor was supporting just for context for our listeners was also uh, staked ETH from Lido uh, and there was the, the Anchor ETH. So that went through Wormhole. Also the Solana ETH uh, did the same thing. So obviously that, that collapsed. Maybe I guess there is a pretty close relationship based on that was there with, with Terra from, from Wormhole. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, how that impacted the wormhole like ecosystem uh and and what what was the situation like uh, in in that moment on on a on a personal note um jump was actually hosting a terra hacker house uh during the terra collapse so when, when that was happening you know the the mood is very somber um i was there everyone was there while, you know what just watching uh the price go up and down um, so that was uh, quite a place to be in. Um, but when that happened, um, it was actually very, I don't want to say calm. It wasn't calm. Uh, but from the wormhole side, um, there wasn't a big upset. Um, because even though we were losing one of our partners, and uh, this was definitely a, a sad day, um, nothing really changed technically. Right. There was there was no exploit on the wormhole side. There was no uh, massive change. The worst thing that wormhole uh, core contributors had to deal with was just the customer support um, of all of the all of the people who were trying to use portal for the first time or the second time and trying to bridge their tokens back from um, uh, from uh, Terra to anywhere else. And so this actually really goes to show the decentralization nature of wormhole where Wormhole wasn't so closely tied to any one chain, even one as big as Terra, even one that was such a big contributor to the TBL for Wormhole, that like Wormhole basically took that uh, hit and was like, yeah, we, we just move tokens back and forth or we just send messages back and forth and that's okay. Um, and the, you know, the Guardians had to figure out, uh, the, the, the big thing that happened technically was uh, on the Guardian side, the wormhole core contributors didn't really have to do much. Um, the guardians um, had to halt Terra because uh, Terra, like when Terra halted, they had to halt Terra. And during the time the Terra was halted, um, uh, there was a number of customer support requests. Why can't I get my tokens out? Well, the chain isn't live, so that's why. Um, and then when the chain was restarted, um, uh, it was a matter of getting, uh, you know, the, are the guardians going to restart the chain? Some guardians wanted to, some guardians didn't. 
Um, and so, you know, uh, that was a whole conversation. But again, from the wormhole core contributor side, because it's decentralized, you know, the core contributors were like, well, whatever the guardians want to do, that's great. Like, there's there's no extra code to be written. Terra didn't change its code base, right? Um, it was just a matter of uh, guardians deciding, yeah, we want to support the new Terra network or we don't, or uh, we want to halt it or we don't and all of these things. Yeah, right. I think it overall in, in this incident, like most of the technical infrastructure actually has performed very well. I think even like on the Terra side itself, right? Like Tender Mint and the smart contract code that kind of made the that made up the system worked very well and under this high load and and i don't think anything happened on that and like ma most of the problems were more around like on the terror side around you know there being so much luna minted that some attack would have become likely and then all these these things that had to be done because of that uh but generally i think like a very interesting kind of stress test in a real environment of course of course like Unfortunately, a lot of people lost money, including all, all these organizations or lost business and, and really like a huge blow up, of course. But uh, I, I guess it also kind of proved that some of these infrastructure is actually ready for really big um, kind of uh, use uses, uh, which is maybe not necessarily true even for like centralized systems sometimes where uh, things might fall apart uh, more than, than what we've seen there. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. I think... One of the big things that also in this event happened, um, I guess, is because of the price disparity on on different networks um, there and Luna price crashing fast and people um, trying to arbitrage it and stuff like this. So there's a lot of like this MEV, I guess, essentially on in that moment, especially which which makes up I think a lot of the overall MEV in, in some of these networks, like these these tail events. How, from the wormhole perspective, was there anything like notable from that? Do you is there is there anything that that wormhole like I guess that that impacted it or that facilitated it or that you saw? Yeah, yeah. So so one one kind of pro not problem. One of the one of the one of the challenges with bridging is that inherently because you're going from one infrastructure to another. Um, if you have, for example, a market of, if you have a liquid market of a token on two different uh, infrastructure providers, you're going to have price disparity. And this is actually not even a, a blockchain problem. This is just a markets problem. And if you have two markets, the two markets are going to have different prices, right? Whether that's a centralized two marketplaces or decentralized marketplaces, it doesn't really matter. By the virtue of them being different marketplaces, they're going to have different prices. Um, and so, um, with uh, people bridging tokens back and forth between portal, um, you know, they often uh, were doing so uh, to try to take advantage of price disparity on one market, say on Solana and Serum, or another on Uniswap on Ethereum and so on. Um, but again, that doesn't really have uh, anything to do with wormhole technicals. That was just, um, it, it was something that we could enable, wormhole could enable um, with uh, people taking advantage. And I don't actually think that's a negative thing. Uh, because that's basically how we normalize price, right? If if there was no way for people to be able to bridge currencies uh, from one to, from one infrastructure to another, then you would have even higher price disparity uh, because you wouldn't be able to normalize that price. Uh, but because people could bridge that currency back and forth between two infrastructure providers, there's a there's a, a much more easier path to normalization of that price. Yeah, I, I think I agree there. I guess also like, yeah, if you don't have that, maybe the only way or like people that can do it are more there where there is like some centralized component that is able to like trade on both sides or just like allows you to bridge, like I guess like just a centralized exchange. So definitely this is, uh, I guess, better by nature of just being accessible to everyone and not, um, yeah, including everyone. So I think that that's really cool. I mean, that really goes to show uh, how important that all, this infrastructure also is. In a sense, this Terra applications and everything was like some of the most used stuff on, on Wormhole. And maybe you can talk a little bit about what right now, what are like exciting applications. I think we also touched upon a, bit, a little bit in, in the course of this uh, interview, but maybe you can also talk a little bit more about like what's, 
what's some exciting things that are being built on Wormhole right now that, that you're seeing or maybe also that you're not seeing and, and you want to see? Um, stuff like a lot of stuff that is being built is a lot of DeFi stuff, which is very exciting. Uh, you know, token swaps and uh, things of that nature. Uh, things that I wish uh, where more people were building on top of Wormhole um, would be um, things of the, uh, like uh, cross-chain governance or cross-chain games um, and using VAs as uh, identity modules and all of these. Uh, there's some advanced things that you can do with Wormhole that people haven't really tapped into yet uh, because, again, the current zeitgeist has been around tokens, um, which makes sense, right? Tokens, everyone loves tokens. Uh, but I like as a personal note, I think there's a lot of really cool non-token use cases that I'm, I'm excited for people to really tap into um, and build on, um, such as cross-chain governance. Right, makes sense. I think yeah, right. You, they are, your job, I guess, also like maybe let's talk a little bit around that. Like I guess developer relations, right? So from the developer perspective, maybe just a question just in general again. I I guess how would developers interact with wormhole actually what's the best way is there is there like a also like a plugin if if i say like i'm a dab that i can kind of somehow have wormhole be plugged in into my dab or how how does it look in practice and and maybe also like what are you working on to make that even easier yeah so integrating with wormhole is a spectrum on the very easy side you can just integrate with wormhole by just accepting wormhole assets right like just accepting portal assets natively um, so if you just do that, you have done the, uh, you know, a very easy integration, um, on the more advanced side, uh, you can do integrations with wormhole by sending messages back and forth, um, using the wormhole core layer, um, which is a much more advanced integration. Um, so you can learn all about the different types of integrations and how to get started with doing all of this at book.wormhole.com. Uh, this is our documentation for developers. Um, and we're working on a number of sample projects. Um, that documentation isn't live yet. I'm working uh, on it. Uh, but uh, there's there's going to be a number of sample projects that actually show you how to make use of things going back and forth um, and being able to launch in production. So, right, like we talk about this, I think um, if you're, I guess uh, there's also like other things you're working on to you mentioned the hacker house that, that Jump was hosting. Like, I guess in general, what kind of initiatives do you um, have to, I guess, recruit developers or like help them or, uh, yeah, get this ecosystem going? Yeah. Um, so there's a, we're working on a, right now X Hack, which is uh, Jump uh, Jump Crypto's uh, premier event. It's a cross-chain chain agnostic hackathon starting Monday of this week, which I don't know when this uh, podcast will go live, uh, but it'll be September 26th, um, you know, uh, it, and it'll uh, go for four weeks. Um, so we're, we're working with developers in all different ecosystems and challenging them um, to, like, get started with working on uh, working on wormhole stuff. Um, so that's uh, that's one of the big avenues um, right now that, you know, uh, all, all of us are heads down trying to get that get that going. Yeah, that sounds pretty exciting, and I hope we're not releasing this way too late that no one can uh, look into this. But if if we do, then hopefully there's also like some exciting use cases come up, come out of that 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 you can look at and maybe expand on. Um, I think that's that's all the questions I had. Uh, Dev, thanks so much uh, for coming on for uh, talking to us about Wormhole and giving us a bit of better view, since I think you know a lot of the mystery maybe sometimes around it if you're not like uh in this ecosystem i think our listeners that will also have learned a lot today so uh that i really appreciate it uh, if there's anything else you want to shout out to or like uh talk about now's time uh but yeah thanks so much for for joining me today and uh best of luck thank you felix